This is the Seven Figure Agency Podcast. Discover the strategies and techniques to grow a highly successful and profitable digital marketing agency with your host, Josh Nelson. All right, well, hello and welcome. I'm super pumped for today's interview. We're going to be interviewing Chris Pistorius from Kickstart Dental Marketing. Um, has jumped the gap to seven figures over the last 12 months. He's been at it much longer than that, and we'll hear his story. But over the last 12 months, he has made it to that next level. And so without further ado, Chris, thank you so much for joining us on, on this interview today. Thanks, Josh. It's been a long time coming, so I, uh, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to interview me. No, man, it's, it's, it's awesome. I could not be more excited to, to feature you and kind of your success and, and your growth. Before we start, tell everybody where you're at right now, because it's, <laughs> it's a special thing Chris is doing for us. Yeah, so I'm actually on vacation, spring break vacation in Aruba right now. So we're on our sixth day and uh, came up from the beach and uh, and uh, doing this interview gladly. So um, just appreciate you taking the time. But yeah, it's uh, sunny and 85 degrees in Aruba right now. So that's what you're competing nice. with. <laughs> doesn't get any doesn't get any better than that. Give me a, a yes or a one or a like if you're watching this and you're appreciative that Chris came up from the sand <laughs> to share some of his best insights with us on, on today's interview. Good stuff. So before we start, Chris, kind of just tell us a little bit about your agency, who you serve, kind of the, the lay of the land. Yeah, so um, obviously we're in dental, but we also specialize in uh, orthodontic as well, which an orthodontist is a dentist as well. But um, so we have been serving the dental community for about um, 11, actually almost 12 years now. Um, I, I take that back about 10 years. The first two years of my agency was kind of a general be all agency. I fuse internet marketing and, and we took on pretty much anybody who had a checkbook and could pay their bill. So we kind of started with, you know, the big, the big model and then scaled down a lot of thanks to this group uh, and found the niche in dental um, about 10, nine to 10 years ago, I guess. And um, I, I think, Josh, when I started the group, I was around, I don't know, $20,000 a monthly revenue or so, and just kind of created a job for myself. And so we evolved through the years and, and took some solid advice from this group and yourself and, and, and finally uh, grow, into a, grow into a decent pace. That's amazing, man. Seven figures in dentistry, arguably one of the toughest niches in my mind, especially with everything that's happened with COVID-19 over the last you know, 24 months, 12 months, however long it's been, it feels like years. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of how you've managed to get through COVID and with the, a lot of these dental practices shut down, how you've kept the clients and continued to, to grow the business despite. Yeah. So before I get into the COVID specific, I mean, you're right. The dental niche is incredibly competitive. Pretty much anybody who has a computer and um, knows anything about the internet, it's automatically a, a digital marketing expert in any field, but it seems like people are really attracted to dentistry. So we have that to compete with, but also dentistry within itself is so competitive that the other end of it, once you have a client and being able to get them the results that they want to get in such a competitive market can be, um, can be pretty tough as well. So both ends of our spectrum is fairly competitive, um, but COVID was, you know, like we kind of talked about off the air, it was kind of a flat year for us. Um, and we're lucky, we feel fortunate to, to be in that situation. And literally every one of our clients mandatorily had to shut down for at least 30 days. And some of them shut down for um, 90 days or 120 days. So we were, we were concerned that, you know, we've got to let them kind of hit the pause button for sure. But what does hooking back up with us look like, right? What if, I mean, it could be very easy for them to say, you know, once things got better and they could open, oh, you know what, we're just going to kind of stay paused until we see what's going on over the next year or so. So our concern on our team was, okay, we can pause them, do the right thing there, but how, what's our strat, our, our, our immediate thoughts went to, what's our strategy to get these folks back as well as can we still grow and, and target the right types of dentists in this downtime to get them to realize that they, this is a time for them to jump ahead with marketing. So that was really my, myself, my team's focus. And I got to tell you, you know, I'm going to give you this group all the props, but, you know, I got a lot of advice during that time frame from this group. Um, Jimmy was a big part of it as well. He's in dental as well. And um, he talked a lot about going overboard with communication during the downtime 
and build loyalty with those people so that when it does time come time for them to come back, not only are they going to come back, they're going to come back with referrals and just a sense of loyalty like never before. And I got to tell you, that's exactly what happened. So we, we built out a program to stay on top and reach out to dentists every week on what's going on, how to apply for PPP loans, you know, anything we could think about. A lot of our clients, we said, don't worry about it. We're not going to stop working on your campaigns, even though you've canceled with us or paused with us. We're going to keep working and running the campaign so that when we come out of this, you're going to be ahead of a lot of people that have decided to kind of pause all marketing. And that built some mad loyalty and it was a, a waiting game. And once we came out of it, we saw these clients come back to us and they were very appreciative of what we did for them. Um, and, you know, yeah, we lost, we lost a few, but most of them came back and we were actually at, able to add on uh, several clients as referrals uh, based off our existing uh, client base. So. So good. So you just doubled down on service and communication during the, during the downturn, you took a little bit on the chin, some of the, the revenue that you couldn't collect, uh, but you, you continue to plant those seeds, which have germinated and, and helped you continue to grow once, uh, once the dental offices all started opening back up again. Yep, exactly. Love it. So, so good. Um, talk a little bit about the, the transition because you know, as we grow agencies, we go through these stages of growth from startup to struggle, to scale, to success, to significance. And oftentimes we kind of hit, hit ceilings, whether intentional or not. Talk a little bit about how you made it through that plateau of that, like that, that transition from scale where you've got a team and you've got revenue all the way through to 83,000 or more in monthly recurring revenue. Yeah, it, it was tough. And I, I think that honestly, that's, been for me anyway the toughest part of business because like I said when we first or when I first started all I did was create a job for myself I didn't know what I was doing I just knew a lot about marketing I was good at sales and um, I got some clients and and I started just doing everything myself and I, I just created that job what was hard for me was letting go and hiring people number one hiring is hard it was the hardest thing for me to do and it honestly is, continues to be the hardest thing for me and finding people training people um, keeping people, that kind of stuff. But the big part of that was letting go of, okay, I'm not the one that's going to do the SEO anymore, or I'm not the one that's going to take care of the client. I have to rely and trust somebody else, you know, who isn't me to do that. And, and that was hard to, to get over. But, you know, again, I'll go back to it. Um, having a group like this, and at that time, I was involved with some other groups as well, but just having people in the industry that are soundboards and have gone through some of this, you know, was a huge help. And it saved me a lot of money and a lot of time. So, you know, I think it was just trial and error, learning from other people, um, and then just kind of doing a timeout meeting with myself and saying, hey, dude, you got to, in order to get to the next level, you've got to get some help and you've got to be able to trust the people that you hire. So. Yeah, good, good, good stuff. So excited to see kind of like where you're at today and kind of how you kind of bridged the gap. Um, Going back kind of to the, to the beginning when it was iFuse Marketing and you were a generalist agency, um, let's talk a little bit about how you wound up landing on the, on the dental niche. Like what brought you to that vertical? Yeah, well, I wish I had some really cool creative story about this, but it was honestly, at the time, I, I realized pretty quickly that, look, every time we bring on an auto repair shop or an attorney or somebody else like that, we've got to learn the industry, we've got to learn the lingo, and what works, what doesn't. And sometimes by the time we're able to do that, it's too late. And we've lost a client. We lost a lot of clients back then because of that. Um, so we, I just kind of looked at the books and I was like, look, we got like six dentists already. They pay their bills on time. They're fairly easy to work with. Um, and we're getting pretty good results with them. They're, they're the longest industry of, that we were able to retain. So they stayed with us the longest. And I was like, man, there's a lot of people, you know, trying to sell to dentists. And it's not easy because I knew that from previous experience too. And I was like, heck with it. We've got some momentum. Let's, let's get some testimonials. Let's, you know, just run with it and see what happens. And you know, you, you remember this. I mean, even I was a year or two, three into it. I'm still saying, Josh, man, there's got to be an easier niche, right? There's got to be a better way to do this. Yeah. And you're the one that talked me out of, you know, kind of dropping dentistry and, and keeping, keeping the march forward. And so it wasn't like we immediately did it. And it was like overnight success. We still had to work at it, build at it, you know, build a name and a brand in the industry and go with it. But yeah, it's, it's worked out very well for us. 
I love it. So for you, the, the niche selection process was you had a client base, you had revenue, you recognized there was you know, frustration jumping from one vertical to the other, figuring out how to deliver results in different verticals. And you kind of looked at the base of business and said, where's our best clients? We're the ones that are sticking. Where do we already have some wins? And let's try and gaze our focus on that, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I love it. So those initial seedling clients, just just for the for the folks that are listening, where where did those clients come from? Like, how did you get them? <laughs> so, you know, and and I can't do this now, but as soon as I can, I'm going to do this again. But <laughs> um, if you remember. Um, Pre-COVID, it seems like you said it seems like years ago, but how I got to start was actually just walking into dentists with a little information packet, which I saw. It's funny you mentioned this because I just saw what I created years ago the other day. It's still in like my Google Doc somewhere, and I just cringed at it because it was so bad compared to the stuff that we put out now. I mean, you've probably seen that before too, right? You go back to your old stuff, and you're like, oh, man. <laughs> But so we created this kind of just an information pack and I just kind of busted indoors and said, Hey, I'm Chris. I'm a dental marketing expert. Um, I think you probably need some more new patients. Here's some information. Who can I follow up with? And it was just face to face going indoors and introducing myself. And there were no fancy automations like I've got going on now, no cold emails. Um, it was just me walking indoors and, um, Years later, even before COVID, I still had that position in place. It wasn't me, but I would still have somebody going into local markets door to door, just introducing themselves and kind of getting the ball rolling. And then I would take that information that they gather, put them into like high level and do automated, um, you know, responses, things like that. But that was still a, a big source of new business for us um, and will be as soon as we can start doing that again uh, post COVID. I love that old school that most people don't yeah. even think about and would, would never dare to do to get into their car, drive to a place of business and, and do some straight up door to door prospecting. Yep. Right. Um, yep. And that was probably where you got, you know, what would you say like 20 or 30% of your clients early on, maybe even more, more than that early on. Um, and then before COVID probably 20% of our new clients were coming that way. Um, it's just, it's what I knew, right? It's the industry that I came from and that's how we always did things. And it doesn't work for every industry because, you know, sometimes you've only got, you know, whatever industry you're in, you may only have two or three of them in a city. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it was to the point right before COVID where not only was I going to do it locally, I'm in the Denver Metro area. So basically we try to work with one practice in each market. So, I mean, there's tons of little markets around Denver, but it was getting to the point where I was going to hire these people in other markets and test that to see if I could get that same type of response. So it's very effective. It really is. So that would be like cold, cold canvassing, right? That's and right. People would say, well, that thought wouldn't work because the dentist is behind the chair and you can never get the dentist attention. And you got to sell to the dentist. How do, how do you get the attention of the right person dropping in at the office? Just curious, kind of like talk to, talk to listeners through this, through this angle and give me a one, if you want to hear how Chris, makes this work in his agency. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of ones I see popping up. So yeah. that's a good thing, right? Yes. They, they want to hear. There's no twos. So that's good. Yeah. But no, um, you know, it's think of it as being a cold email on steroids, right? I mean, if you're in dental or anywhere in healthcare, you know that you need to get to the doctor, but you know that typically you're going to get an email address, not to the doctor, you're going to get one to the front desk. So we knew this going in, we're not going to talk to the dentist. So we always go after the office manager. So the person that does this has a list of, it's kind of like the dream 100, right? So we take that list of ones that we want to work with locally and we have them do the research the day before of who they're going to go see that day. And maybe it's 25 different practices. And they look on the website of who's in charge. You know, we know the doctor. We need to know the office manager. And so when they walk in, they know the names, of the people that they need to contact. So it's a very personalized cold email, if you will. Um, and we always have a little tchotchke. We give away candy or, you know, something for the front desk. They love that. It's kind of break the ice. And the only, we're not trying to sell them. All we're trying to do is introduce ourselves to them and get the best contact information we possibly can from them, which enables us to follow up with text message, if, usually not text message, honestly, but mostly email and pick up the phone and call and just say, hey, we were in your office last Wednesday. Just being able to say that, like we were physically in your office the week before, 
puts you miles above your competition, the guys that are sending just solely cold emails or whatever it may be. So it definitely has given us a leg up. So it's, um, it's a coordinated approach, right? You don't just start dropping in and think the dentist is going to sign on the dot, right? It's you go to the office, you know who the office manager is, you've got something to leave behind and you're using that to soften the beach so that you can call and have a higher probability of getting through because you were physically there and you kind of tapped into the power of reciprocity by leaving something behind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're looking for them to raise their hand, right? What we talk about in the group all the time. If, if we can get you know, two people to raise their hand during that eight hour shift, we're in really good shape, right? Because it's a, it's a numbers game. And you'd be surprised how many people have, have said, you know what, we were kind of looking into doing something with our website, or we, we are looking to do something with, with marketing. I'm glad you came in. So sometimes you hit those people at just the right time. You know, it's not about the, you know, the 30 people you go see that day that say no, it's about the one or two that say yes. And that's what you've got to be able to stay focused on. Yeah. Yeah. Some will, some won't. So what? Yeah. And really this plays, you're trying to catch the people that are in the, in the change phase in their, in their buying decision. Um, I like how you were able to take this from something early that you did, which was very time consuming and, and like low leverage to something you were able to put someone in place to do. Was that a full-time job? Was that like part-time as they had time? Like, how did you structure that role? I'm just curious. Yeah. So um, I tried to target very successful people that were just either out of a job or they just had kids and they're home with their kids and they wanted a part-time job. There's a lot of people in that situation, um, especially now. Um, so I was really flexible on the hours. So if I only had one person doing it like four hours a day, three times a week, no problem. As long as they're really qualified to do it. Great. And if I need another one, I'll just hire another one like that. Right. Or if I get one person full time to do it, that's typically enough. Love it. So just enough to kind of keep the pipeline inching forward, a couple of new appointments with dentists per, per month. Um, and it was enough to, to kind of keep the, the pipeline full. It's usually per week, we'd get one or two, you know, kind of hands raised and, and they were better leads than what you typically would get just from cold stuff. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it definitely got my agency started and was still, you know, like I said, probably 20% of my business up before COVID hit. Yeah. I love it. Give me a one in comments. If this is something like different, right. Oftentimes we all want to do the same exact thing that everybody else is doing. And the reality is the best thing you can do is find the one thing that most people aren't, right? Whether that's cold, you know, cold drop-ins, like he's talking about cold um, mail, um, you know, being a little bit more aggressive with your cold calling. Um, I think it's interesting because I know you tested direct mail, you tested drop-ins, and you tested a lot of cold email. Uh, and you did find, I believe, that the cold drop-ins just was exponentially more effective for you. Can you talk a little bit about why you think that is? I think people want to buy from people. And, you know, when you, when you present a human being in front of another one, I think you always have a better chance. That's, I could be dead wrong about that, Josh. I'm not sure, but you're right. I, I tested, you know, direct mail and it works, you know, it does. Um, I tested sending, I don't know if you remember this, I would send FedEx envelopes to people or priority U S mail envelopes. Mm -hmm. um, and that works, but it doesn't work as well as somebody walking in with something physical and saying, Hey, I'm here. I'm an expert. Call me. Right. Cause we would get, it's funny because we would get calls months after one of our people went into the office you know, because they kept that tchotchke there, they kept that information there, and all of a sudden they had a need. So, the you know, the more advanced part of that is we we know what markets that they're going to canvas, if you will, and we'll do targeted Facebook ads, targeted Google ads in that market while they're kind of canvassing it. So if somebody does happen to, you know, do a search or whatever it may be, there, there we are. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do in addition to that. But yeah, they just, they just work better and they convert better. And, you know, I was paying somebody, I think, 15 bucks an hour, which isn't terrible for what they were doing part-time. And, you know, it was a contractor role and, you know, it, it worked great financially as well. Yeah. Ricardo James is saying, Ricardo, great to see you, man. So you have salespeople all over the country walking into dentist office. It's pr primarily just in the, in the greater Denver market, right? Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. It was, but I can tell you the plan was to expand it. I was going to test this in other markets where I wasn't physically located um, my strategy going into business is that there's plenty of dentists here in the Denver metro area to hit seven figures if we only signed people in the Denver metro area. Mm -hmm. So I was like, we should have a little bit of a leg up 
locally because we're here, we're physically here, right? So that's the only reason we started there. But post COVID, I want, I'm gonna get back to this because people can't just walk in and out of dental practices now. So the, 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 the strategy will be, you know, start back up in Denver and then let's do some markets around Denver and see if it works as well. We're not physically located. So good. How many, so usually you can have seven figure business. How many distinct markets are there in Denver? I'm just curious that obviously you've done the math on this, but it's, 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 that's amazing. Yeah, it's fine. I wish we were going to take it down, but we used to have a big map at the office with like pins in it of Denver Metro and we could see exactly where our clients were and where we needed to target. That was the easiest way to do it. You can do it online too, of course, but um, there's a lot, I don't know. There's, you know, Littleton, Parker, Centennial, you know, just tons of them. So, yeah. Very, very cool stuff. Um, I, lo I love the idea. And I think that it is a great scalable model. You can put independent canvassing reps all over the country in the big markets um, mm -hmm. and have that as a, as, a, as a secondary play. In addition to right. all the positioning, like you're obviously very well positioned in the dental space. And um, talk a little bit about that, how you've, how you've positioned yourself as one of the go-to experts in the dental space. That's a good question. And I've, I've resisted it for a long time, but doing stuff like this, we do tons now of video. Uh, we do uh, interviews like this, but we try to interview dentists or anybody in the dental industry and we do podcasting. And um, I recently hired a uh, social media expert from RepStack actually um, a few months ago to help with social media. And, you know, they also have some video training. So they chop up the interviews and make them into social media ads and just posts and things like that. Um, I do a ton of as much as I can of blogging, which takes a lot of time, but that helps as well. And then we submit those out to our email campaigns, but it's all of that, you know, combined that can get you to the point to where you're kind of the go-to person, if you will. And I'm not still not satisfied with where we are. I don't think we ever will be, but um, I think that's also the drive is that we're not satisfied and we've always got to continue getting better and, and leveraging what everybody else is doing and trying to make that better. Right. So um, that's, that's really been the success is all of that. Not just one of those things, but I think all of those things combined um, and can get you, get you where you need to be. No doubt. Um, Edward's asking, so the, what's the compensation like for the walking salesperson? Um, I think you said it's 15 bucks an hour. Do they get a commission or of any sort? Yeah. So uh, the last time we did it a few months ago, we, there's about 15 bucks an hour, but they would get 50 bucks for every good lead, <laughs> if you will. So, so is we, that a booked we, appointment or just somebody that says, yeah, yeah. I'll take your call? It's, it's basically after I meet with them, I'm the one that decides if it's a good lead because I still do all of our new client sales, but we're very clear with the people that we hire, what we consider a good lead. They've got it. You know, I can't call them. They're like, who are you? What are you doing? You know, stuff like that. Like you don't get the 50 um, bucks for that call, right? Yeah. So we give them 50 bucks for that, but I pay them like 300 bucks for every one time fee um, for every one of those appointments that turns into a, a new sale. So, mm. so they can make some good money, right? They get 15 bucks an hour oh, yeah. to hit one office after the other $50 per booked appointment and then $300 per sale. Right. Um, it's a great model that nobody's really talking about that Chris has just shared. So how about a, a thank you in chat if, if you like this idea and think you might be able to leverage it in your, in your market? Um, let's see, Don's asking, you might have missed this. Um, what's your main so – so you work with dentists. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you do for the dentists and kind of what your program looks like? Yeah, so um, we, we don't have packages like a gold, silver, bronze. We, we kind of customize every marketing package based on what practice is looking for. And also, you know, a dentist isn't a dentist to us. And that's a big part of my sales part of it is, look, you've got to come up with a unique selling proposition that makes you different from all the other 50 dentists in your square mile, right? So we talk a lot about strategy and what they need to market based on what they do differently. For instance, we just signed a dentist today and he does house calls still. How many of you have heard of that, right? Never. So that's I didn't gonna be know that existed. <laughs> Right. So that one's an easy one. We quickly identified kind of their unique selling proposition. Um, and they do a lot of special needs dentistry, too, which is, you know, a, an awesome way to promote what they do. So that's what I'm talking about. And, and we talk a lot about that with with these potential clients, but a lot of it's strategy. But we do kind of the norm, right? SEO, high level type services, of uh, auto follow up. Uh, paid ads on Facebook and Google, uh, website stuff, uh, reputation, um, things like that. So, 
Can you give us an idea kind of what a typical monthly range is for a client? Yeah, so it, this is going to be another testimonial for you, actually. When I started the group, I went back and looked at this. We were at about $900 a month per client, and I thought I was pretty happy with that. As of today, we're at almost $2,000 a month per client. Nice. So our packages now start at around $2,000 a month and up. Um, and it's helped me a ton because what I found is you probably already know, a lot of you know, is the smaller clients, you don't make as much money and they're usually twice as much work, <laughs> right? So, you know, cause sometimes you've got to kind of push them into, um, into spending money. So, yeah, so our, that's our, that's our current average of, of what we are, what we're building. I love to hear that, man. Congratulations on getting that number up. And now based on how good you do for your clients, you could probably even, might be time to go to the next, uh, the next rung up, right? It could be. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So, okay. So we've got a, we've got dentists, we're landing them through positioning. We're landing them through kind of foot in the door strategies. Um, let's talk a little bit about retention because that's one of the hardest parts of this mm -hmm. whole business, right? It's one thing to sell a lot of dentists. It's another thing to deliver the goods. It's a whole nother thing to retain them. Just talk to me about some of the things you've done to, to keep your arms around the clients and keep them on board long-term. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up. This is something else that I struggled with early on is I'm pretty good at getting clients, but I'm not good at, at taking care of them. It's not my strong suit. And one of the best hires I ever made was my very first kind of client success manager, we call them. Mm -hmm. And that's somebody that does nothing but take care of the client. They're the first line of defense. And it was the best hire I ever made. Um, her name was Jennifer. That's been a few years now. And she's now our director of operations. And we have two other soon to be and soon to be three client success managers. Um, so she oversees the client success managers now and she oversees some of the other uh, workers that we have. But that was the biggest thing is, you know, just with retention is you've got to take care of people. Uh, a couple of the, I could go on, this could be a whole session on its own, but a couple of big, big things that I did to help with this was number one, doing weekly wins. So no matter what, every week you send an email to the client and you say, look, we got two new reviews or we got six rankings jumped for this particular keyword or, and it's never the same, right? You've got to be, you can't make it sound like robo talk, right? So mm -hmm. just weekly wins helps a ton. Follow up in the first 30 days that you have a client, follow up at least once every three days, um, no matter what, just to let them know what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, because that first 30 days is critical. There's a lot of buyer's remorse, especially when you charge more money. So you've got to make sure that you really stay on top of them, at least in the first 30 days and be religious about getting people to show up for um, monthly meetings to go over results and, and have some sort of automated list of people who aren't showing up that pops up and you know you need to follow up with them to make sure everything's okay. So what you're probably hearing my theme is communicate with these clients because if you don't, somebody else is going to. And it's so easy these days for competitors to come in and talk a great game and, and talk is cheap and, and steal them away. Um, the other thing that I will tell you- um, Hold on, pause there. A, some powerful oh, insights there, guys. I hope you're taking yeah. notes on this. He shared some great, great insights. The number one reason your client's going to leave is perceived indifference. There's nobody yep. that's being attacked more than dentists. And so Chris has had to be very aggressive. He's talking about touching them three, every three days during the launch process. And then every week dropping a win. Is that an email somebody's asking or is that a call or how do you drop that win on them? Usually an email. We've got a template set up, but it's mostly customized because we take extra time for this part of it. Love it. If you like, press a one in, in chat here if, you, if you're getting value from these insights on retention. Keep going. I know you were about to say something else, but I, I definitely want to hear uh, what you were going to talk about next. Yeah, it's brand new. Actually, well, we're into the first quarter of it. Um, and I want to just like the big asterisk here is this will not scale. But for a, an agency my size, it's worked extremely well. At the end, Mark, knock on wood, wherever there's some wood here. At the end of this month will be the first quarter we've not lost any clients at all. Wow. Okay. So ever. And the reason for that, I think, is that I rolled out in January, a bonus plan to basically everybody on the team um, that based on client retention. So it's basically set up in three tiers. If they retain between hundred percent and I think 96%, they get this percent bonus on top of their salary and then B and C tiers. 
Um, after doing some calculations, I realized that I could make a lot of more money, even paying the bonus, if we can retain those clients, right? So that has seemed to gone over really well. I'm going to, if we continue to grow and I continue to bring on employees, I'm going to have to adjust it. But based on, you know, three client success managers, a director of operations, website person, social media person, I don't know, six or seven of us, I guess, it works very well. But once we scale to a lot more employees, it'll have to be changed. But do something to bonus employees on performance and on retention. It, it seems to help. I love that idea of kind of bonusing down the ranks. Usually when we think about bonuses, we think about the sales guy getting a bonus. We think about the account manager maybe getting a bonus. Uh, but the guy building the website, the guy writing the content, the guy you know doing the SEO, for instance, if you give him a little incentive, then the whole team is all hands on deck. Let's let's make sure these clients are getting the best experience, they're getting the best results, and that we're doing everything we can because we want that we want the clients to win. But there's also a little something in it for us as the as the member of the team. Um, great share, I love that idea. And working yeah. apparently you get a hundred percent retention thus far this quarter. We're going to knock on a little bit yeah. more there. All right, yeah, it's it's working well, and I think it continue will continually will work. So good, great great retention tips there. So let's talk a little bit about scale. You know, we got a seven figure agency now. And obviously what got you to you know, six figures is different than what gets you to multiple six figures, which is different than gets you to seven. You talked about some of the key hires along the way. Um, what would you say was the first position that you removed yourself from and how did you fill that role? It was the, it was the kind of account manager or client success manager for sure. Um, and you know, it was, it was the most critical. And for me, it was the most important to do that first, because I think as a business owner, you've got to look at what you're not good at um, and fill that the quickest, right? As long as it makes sense. But for me, it was somebody needs to come in and nurture and take care of these clients. Cause I'm kind of the person where somebody complains about our service or whatever. I, I almost sometimes will get, cause it's my baby. Sometimes I'll get a little defensive. Right. You don't want to do that, right? That's like the opposite of what you want to do. So that's why I hired that. My second hire, will, though, was a director of operations, okay? And that's the person that's taking care and running kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. Very rarely now am I involved in anything day-to-day. -day. Um, the only thing that I do and can concentrate on most of the time is new new business, bringing in new business, doing interviews like this, partnering up with, you know, whoever I can to, to try to 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 forge relationships with. So Jennifer, our director of operations, basically is like running the company day to day, almost like a COO, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was critical. I love it. Yeah, and that's usually that's usually the path, right? The first thing you want to probably get yourself out of is either operations or client services. Yep. And right. then as you grow, it's like, what else can I remove myself from? Um, as you as you've grown. What like what metric do you look for in terms of number of account managers per number of clients? Do you have a metric that you're kind of shooting for in that in that world? Yeah, I think if you scroll through our uh, seven figure agency, you'll see me ask that question at least ten times over the years. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so we we were at about we hit about fifty clients a few months ago, um, and it was a lot for one person. Um, now we've the way we're set up our client success managers. The only thing that they do is take care of clients. They don't help build out campaigns. They don't set up reputation. They don't do anything other than your 100% focus is making sure that client stays with us and is happy. So it's a very stripped down version. So I feel like we can take on a little more, but also we don't rely a ton on automation when it comes to taking care of clients. So a lot of what we do is, you know, handmade and hand done and customized for each client. So we, once we hit 50, we hired another one. Um, now that we're approaching 60, we're going to consider like a third junior level um, for a few months. And then hopefully by the time they've kind of matured into a full CSM level, we'll have hit enough clients to, to have, you know, three of those functions. So I would say 25 to 30 for the way that we do things per client success manager. So we're so we're in that range. And it sounds like you're smart to be hiring before they're over capacity. So they don't start dropping balls on clients, but they can do their job, help out in other areas. and kind of you have a bench that starts to develop. Yeah, and we try to hire these people with a very little experience. It's not about experience with us in this function. It's about personality mm. and, you know, how they just relate to people, how they communicate. We can teach them, you know, the ins and outs of the job, 
or Jennifer can, I can't, but, <laughs> but, you know, as long as they have the right personality, you can pick up people pretty, I don't want to say cheap, but you know, you're not hiring an experienced person and, and you can really groom them into what you want and give them opportunities to, to become more successful within the company. Love it. Yeah. That's been our experience as well. Hire for attitude, train for aptitude, right. Train them up to do the job. Um, it's more cost effective. And like you said, you can kind of control how they, how they behave and how they interact. Being that this is such a critical role and something that, that's, I think, integral to your growth, where have you found your account managers and what kind of things have you looked for in a good account manager in your, in your agency? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we go through the, the Colby, is it the Colby test? Is that right? Yep. Yeah, kind of the personality test. We use that. We don't use it as a, okay, they didn't come back correct. So we're just going to ax them. It, it's mm -hmm. more of a guide for us than anything, but we have seen patterns that we wind up hiring people who do well in the Colby test, but we put them through um, scenarios. So once we interview them and they kind of get further through the process, Jennifer will actually give them and send them three or four different client scenarios. And it has nothing to do with like knowing digital marketing or technical stuff. It's how to handle people. And so we'll say if client XYZ is, is mad about this, then how would you handle that? What would you do? And we actually have them do this for us in a Zoom call after they've studied a little bit. And we look and, and look for patterns of how they communicate, how they just kind of give themselves off, if you will, their attitudes, things like that. Um, and that's helped us probably more than anything, just doing that. Love it. So, so having them take some type of personality assessment, Colby is one mm -hmm. we, we recommend highly looking for the high follow through, high fact find, uh, and then giving them some type of, you know, test, right? If the key thing is how well they communicate, how well they can kind of think on their toes, how comfortable they are on video, then letting them do that as part of the interview process will help you waste time with a candidate that might sound good or seem good on paper, but would never be able to handle the job. Yeah, exactly. It's just puts them in a scenario. I mean, everybody has, you know, has an agency has common scenarios that they get all the time, the same things. Like I never see my ad on, on Google or, you know, whatever it may be. And we just do two or three of those scenarios, have them study a little bit and, you know, have them play it out with us on Zoom. Love it. Give me a one if you can use that as you start to grow and start thinking about, man, I need to remove myself from operations. I need to remove myself from account management. You know, just some good logical thought around how to attract those kinds of people and, and train them up within the role. Don's asking for your, your client success managers. Are they U.S. based or the international? What's the story there? Yeah, they are U.S. based and they're actual full time employees, not contractors or anything like that. We found I've tested both. Um, and I know some of you have been wildly successful with using contractors and, you know, overseas people for even this role, but it just didn't work for us. So we found that it works better U.S. based and, and full time employees versus contractors. 100 percent. My, my preference as well. You want people that are dealing with your, your client and having those one to one conversations. I think you want someone U.S. based and fully dedicated to your to your company. Did you start that way or did you maybe have someone part-time and kind of graduate them to full-time where you came right out of the gates? I've got enough clients. Here's my full-time account manager. Yeah, I handled it for the longest time, um, which were the worst retention rates on record. <laughs> and then I quit. I hired a contractor first. Um, actually, it was a friend of my wife's <laughs> is who I hired to do it. And she did a great job and she was a contractor and she was with me for several years and then she moved on and um, we got a little more serious about the business and more revenue was coming in. So we got a little more formal and, and went through a full-time employee process and, and went that direction. But yeah, I mean, none of this stuff is like I started out, you know, full-time employees with $10,000 a monthly revenue. You got to gradually kind of go into it and, and just know when it makes sense to do it. 100%. And, and he says that retention was bad when he was in charge of it. And I chuckle because it was bad when, when I was in charge of it. The yeah. reality is as the agency owner, we're high, high quick start individuals. And so we like to start things and we want to run to the next. Being an account manager requires you to follow up and follow through and make those calls and have those tough conversations, which probably isn't your strength. And you don't need to feel guilty about that. Like this is something you need to remove yourself from and put someone that can play at that kind of role. And those people exist. Chris is firsthand. Like how much better were your account managers, even though they were just low level trained than, than you were just because of that natural desire to talk and walk people through things. 
uh, it's night and day. I mean, I'm just not that person. And, you know, there's people that, you know, who really excel on taking care of others and making sure they're happy and following through with things. I mean, I got to the point where my office was just sticky notes everywhere on, on, I was going through so many different ways on how do I remember to follow up and I'm just not good at it. So, you know, it's just, there were people out there that are, and God bless them. And they're the only reasons that I have a business, honestly. 100%. Great insight. Hopefully that's empowering for you. If you're listening to this, you know, put empowering if comments of just, just knowing that you don't have to necessarily hold on to that or feel bad that you're not great at the client relationship side of the equation. Um, Edward and, and Daniel are asking about compensation for a client success manager. Can you give a range kind of what you started at for, for those types of roles? Yeah. So we start with those roles. Again, we try to hire junior level and then, you know, kind of handhold them to the senior level, but for a junior level, 35 to 40,000 a year. Yep. Um, and then, you know, once they get good and, you know, you know, you obviously bonus them on top of that, you give them incentives and then uh, we do salary increases every year. We try to knock on wood if we can afford it. So my, my strategy isn't around cheap labor. I'm just mm -hmm. not that way. And I think that if you try to, if you try to skim on things like that, you're going to wind up losing people and you're going to get into this cycle of just training people, you know, lose people, get somebody on, train them, lose somebody. And so far, thank goodness, we've lost very few employees. We pay them well. We probably pay them more than we should, honestly, but I want good, dedicated people that I can trust. And for me anyway, that's, that's a big part of, of how to keep folks. So, so good. Such a great insight. I hope that's not lost on you guys that you don't want to try and find the leap, the cheapest labor. You don't need to go pay people six figures either, but you need to pay <laughs> them healthy enough that they can make a, like they can live their, their, their life. Right. And they can be happy with the role in your company. Um, the other thing that should be, you know, something that's a takeaway is you don't have to pay an account manager $60,000 per year. Um, and the way you do that is just like he said, hiring somebody that has the right attitude and desire, but not necessarily the, the, the pedigree or the experience. Um, Chris, I'm sure you've experienced this. I know I did. If I were to go to market and say, I'm looking for someone with four years of experience working in an agency, experience with SEO, pay-per-click, social media that can handle my accounts, inevitably, what is going to be their financial expectation? I'm sorry, you broke up just a little bit there, Josh. What was that question? What, what do you think when, when you go to try and find someone that's got all of the background and all of the experience, what usually happens in terms of what they're expecting? Yeah, well, a couple of things. They're expecting more money, um, number one. But what we've found anyway is that we try to train people the way that we do things. And sometimes when they come in with that much experience, they're kind of already set in their ways. And it's very hard to retrain them, if you will, the way that we want our client success managers to work and act. Um, it's kind of like the can't teach an old dog new tricks type of thing. It's a little bit that way. So, and, and we brought on people like that before where, you know, they weren't coachable. And it was a tough situation and it, and it caused some, you know, friction and we don't want any of that. So what I found is they want more money right off the bat, um, but it's very hard to, to train them and get them to kind of work the way that we want to work. Yeah, just so true, right? They want more money. They're harder to retain. Um, and, and, you know, just it, it isn't always what it seems like it is. So you can get quality talent. We've had the same or about that thirty five to forty two thousand dollars per year range. Um, if you break that out down into a monthly full-time person on your team, it's not that expensive for the improved retention that you're able to get from your business. Um, right. Great stuff. Wesley says 100% account manager is critical for retention. It takes so much off the plate of the agency owner. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So Edward wants to know, like, in addition to the cold drop-in stuff, are there any other tactics that are working well for you for landing clients in the dental space? Yeah. So um, we're starting to see some of the fruit of our labor of our uh, podcasting and doing interviews like this and promoting those out to our, e I mean, we've got an email list now, of, which should be a lot bigger, but a few thousand dental practices, orthodontists, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be way, if I had paid attention to what you were saying in the very beginning, I would have a much bigger list, but um, it, we're starting to see some of that um, actually help. So doing these podcasts and interviews, sending those out is building, you know, kind of 
top of mind type brand awareness of, mm. oh, who are those people that send me a weekly email and they seem to really know what they're doing and, you know, that type of stuff. Um, but we do, we do everything. So there's um, some lists that I'm on. Like if you do, um, you know, if you search for something like dental marketing company or top dental marketing companies, um, you'll find us on almost every list, top 10 list that there is. Nice. Um, I started very early getting involved with those people, building relationships and have slowly built, you know, some top placements on those. We get a ton of business from that. I, I shouldn't say a ton, but we get a lot of our business from that. Also our SEO efforts. I know that there's a lot of members in the group that say they don't get a lot off of SEO. And I think it kind of depends on the industry, but we get a lot of people finding us organically when they type in things like dental marketing companies, you know, things like that. Um, we do a lot of, uh, we've gotten a lot of good reviews from our clients, not as many as I want over the years, but um, we've got enough to, that are really good, compelling um, videos. Um, again, there's no silver one, you know, if you shouldn't do one thing to get new clients, go out and do everything you possibly can test it for your industry, see what works and just make sure you track it because what gets tracked gets done or gets measured, you know, in my book. So, um, you know, it's, it's not one thing. It's just a, a little bit of everything for us. So good. So a mixed strategy, some direct outreach through drop-ins, mm -hmm. some great positioning, nurturing the database with content, interviews, case studies, um, and it kind of keeps the, the pipeline full with new, new potential clients that enter the fold and become, become clients. Yeah, you, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Josh, but one other thing that, that we did, you know, I think at the last live intensive was we talked a lot about the case studies and how to make videos out of those. Mm. If you go to our website on kickstartdental.com and kind of scroll down to the middle page or so, you'll see where we did some of those uh, we used video ask nice. to actually record um, that process. And we've got three or four, I think, yeah. um, actual um, clients that did that for us. It's kind of hard to get them to talk, talk them into it at some points, but yeah. that just, you know, that, that's a, that's a huge one for us because people can see a dentist, you know, that's going through the same things they probably are. And, you know, talking about that and how good and how much we help them. I mean, that's just like pure gold in marketing. So. That's a biggie. hundred percent. Cementing yourself as the expert, not just by sharing case studies, but having your clients on video saying how much you've helped them and what a great job you've done. Um, powerful, powerful positioning there. Yeah. Uh, yep. Great stuff. Well, Chris, Chris is again, he's in Aruba right now. He came <laughs> up on the beach to do this. If you have any questions for Chris, before we wrap up, put them in chat. Um, one question I have is, you know, one of the biggest obstacles you have to face in growing your agency to remove yourself from the day-to-day, -day, which you have done very successfully, um, is, is getting that operations manager in place and empowering them to, to make the decisions and to kind of make sure that the, the work is getting done. Can you talk a little bit about your journey and, and kind of getting that person in place and getting them to the place where they're capable to do that on your behalf? Yes. So I think the reason that that's been successful for me is because that person started out as a client success manager and over the years grew into that position. So by the time she got to be a director of operations, she really already knew our business inside and out. Right. So I think that helped a ton. Um, I think it just, you know, again, it's just so much about not the technical aspect of the job at any level of this company and other than, you know, like technical website building things like that but it's so much about personality and culture just finding the right person it's about you knowing what type of person it's going to take to fill that position and then finding them right so you can teach them your business you can teach them just about anything you you want to but you can't teach attitude you can't teach caring you can't teach compassion none of that stuff and if you can find that type of person you'll be able to teach them the rest love it so if nothing else, it's, it's empowering to know that it is possible to nurture people to that place. And you can find someone that's better at managing the day-to-day -day than you are, right? Suffice it to say, Chris? Right. Awesome. Somebody here is asking, uh, Lainey, I think, I apologize if I'm saying this wrong, the name of the social media service you were talking about earlier, I think you're talking about uh, your RepStack VA? Yeah. Yeah, Can you just talk stack. about a little bit about in the in the seven figure agents that we've been talking a lot about? 
getting a VA, getting them trained up, getting them onboarded to, to give you an extra pair of hands for your own marketing and positioning work. Can you talk a little bit about what you have your VA doing there? Yeah, we've actually got two folks from RepStack. In fact, I think we were one of the first ones to, to bring people on. I know um, we really talked to them at the last live intensive is where that relationship started a few months ago. So um, I quickly identified that, okay, cool. So there, I'm tr always looking for, so let me back up just a little bit. Our agency is mostly US-based employees, um, but we do have spots where we believe that overseas folks can have a huge impact and they have. So what I was, what I've always had a problem with is finding overseas people to trust. And, you know, we've gone through over the years, a lot of overseas people that will hire some, they never show up for work or we hire some and they go through training and then they don't show up for work or we hire people, they show up for work for three months and then they don't show up just a hodgepodge of, of failures there. But <laughs> once I found that there was somebody in our group in seven figure agency that understands our program and they're starting this company that's going to actually hire and train people to work like we do, you know, that's obviously a, a big positive for us. So I was like, yeah, I raised my hand and I said, let's go for it. So we hired one person to do. So we have somebody on our team that does nothing but listen to phone calls. Mm. Okay. And they listen to all of these client lead phone calls that come in. And then they use our software to disposition those calls. Were they good leads? Were they not? You know, what were the names of the good leads? And they type them in there, just kind of show that funnel in high level, for instance. Yep. So we hired one person to do that. She's been awesome. And, you know, that's, that's a big need for us. Um, we hired another one who has my marketing assistant who does nothing but do social media posts for us, promotes those posts. She does video editing. So like interviews like this that we do and podcasts. She'll chop those up into social media posts, boost them. Um, she's in charge of our whole social media um, strategy. She also does sales proposals for me. So mm. she will actually, um, you know, I'll say, hey, we've got somebody that raised their hand. We need a proposal done by Thursday. I trained her how to do that. She puts it together and then I review it and kind of make last minute edits to it. Um, also, um, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. Our first VA, um, she does the, she listens to all the phone calls that come in. She also uh, validates lists for us. So like we work off the dream 100. So I'll send her a couple hundred records in an Excel spreadsheet and she'll actually physically call in, go to people's websites and make sure that we have the right contact person. We have the best email address. We have the right phone number just to validate the data that we have so that then she submits it to me and I call on it and put it into high level, things like that. So they do a lot for us. And I think that those are especially two positions that you can hire overseas for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so far worked very well for us. So good. Thank you for sharing. Put a, put a yes in comments if you've gotten a lot of takeaways from Chris's interview here. Lots of great insights, lots of great, great feedback. Thank you so much for sharing. Congratulations on your, on your success, on, on making it you know, to the seven figure significance level. Um, I have an award headed your way, which I'm excited to get into your hands. So um, stay <laughs> tuned for that. Any awesome. last words of wisdom you'd have for the agencies that are you know, just, just pressing forward, trying to figure out how to get to the next level. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's just don't give up, right? I think it's stay strong, um, use the philosophies of this course, because, you know, I've been a member for four, four years, I think three or four years now, and I've gone, I'm, I'm the real deal. I mean, feel free to email me, call me, whatever you want to do. But, you know, I've grown from when I first started here from 20,000 to now it's about 85,000 of monthly revenue. Um, it didn't happen overnight, but a lot of that success has to do with this program and, and not just Josh. I mean, Josh, you're awesome, of course, but it's the people involved in it because, I mean, for a long time, there's been, you know, there's other dental folks in this group and we bounce ideas off of each other and, and that, that helps. So use this group, use the people in this group, um, don't give up and, you know, just pay attention. You know, there's a lot of, it's not about sitting back and waiting for something to happen. It's about you creating opportunity and being aggressive in the marketplace. And, you know, it's, I think a combination of those things and, and you'll be successful. I love that. Great, great insights, great feedback. Go and enjoy Aruba. Thank you so right. much for taking the time. Um, if you have questions, follow up questions for Chris, he's in the members group, feel free to tag him in. Um, he's, when he's not in Aruba, He's extremely helpful <laughs> when he's on Facebook because he's not the most active, right? You would say you're probably not the most active on Facebook. 
Yeah, probably not. But, you know, it's just reach out to me, just send me a direct message and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely uh, hook up with you and we'll figure out any questions that you might have. Awesome, man. You rock. Thanks again for taking the time. We'll talk to you again soon. Be sure to okay. tag Chris and thank him for sharing and congratulate him on his, uh, his success. All right, guys, we'll talk to you later.